Thank you, Sister Logan. <clears throat> this text, <clears throat> Numbers 14.8, uh, we've spoken about this uh, context here before. You know, this is uh, before they entered into Canaan, after Israel had been delivered from Egypt. And this is after the spies were sent into the land, uh, one from each tribe, 12 spies went in. And you remember the report that they brought back. Ten of the spies said, yes, it is a, a land that flows with milk and honey, just like God said, but there's also giants in the land, and there's too many people, and there's fenced and walled cities. And it's, in other words, there's, this is it's too much for us. We can't do this. Well, and you know here, this is when Joshua and Caleb spoke up. Actually, Caleb spoke first, and he said, it's a good land. We're able to go up and take it. Let's go now. Matter of fact, he said, let's go up and take it now. And the, the scriptures say in the first verse of chapter 14, the people wept all night. That night, the people wept. Boo-hoo-hoo. Here, the, lo the Lord delivered us from Egypt, and we're just going to die in the promised land now. That's what they said. So we're, we're going to die Wish we'd had just gone back to Egypt, they said. They, they would, these people just hadn't put any thought into what had happened to them. This is, now this is the promised land now we're talking about, that hundreds of years ago, God promised to Abraham and his seed forever. The Lord repeated this several times. And his seed forever, for an everlasting possession. So here, now they... Oh, several hundred years go by, they've been in slavery in Egypt for, for at least 400 years, and now they've been delivered from Egypt with the mighty right hand of God. They, they, received the, they cross the Red Sea on dry ground, they come to Mount Sinai, and God gives them a fiery law. Now they, they come to the borders of the promised land, the spies go in and, and spy out the land and report what it's like, and the people don't want to go in. This is the promise. This is their heritage. The promised land of Canaan. God had prepared this before a time for them. And they, they were wicked people. They did not believe. That's why they couldn't enter in. Now this text, <clears throat> actually this is Joshua and Caleb said this. When the people made these statements, they wanted to go back to Egypt and they wanted to choose them a captain to lead them back to Egypt. Moses and Aaron, I, I get the picture that they were just almost speechless at this. It says they fell on their faces in the, on the ground. They, just, they didn't even say anything. Moses and Aaron just fell on their faces. I get the impression they were thinking, oh no, oh no, here it comes, because they knew the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. They knew what the Lord's reaction was going to be to this. They just fell on their faces. But Joshua and Caleb, they rent their clothes, and this is what they had to say. If the Lord, part of what they had to say, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Now this is very similar to what, jo what, pardon me, what Caleb said later on in the promised land before Joshua died, the text that we looked at a few months back. <clears throat> When he said, Now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out. As the Lord said, these very similar words here, only then Caleb's emphasis was driving out the enemy. I'll be able to drive them out. Well here, before they entered in, Joshua and Caleb's emphasis was, We are going to obtain these good things. If the Lord delights in us, we'll obtain this good land. So a slightly different emphasis, but basically he's saying the same thing. <clears throat> They'll receive the goodness of the land if the Lord delights in us. <clears throat> there are many religious people who refuse the good land. Well, if there are several reasons. For one, they don't see how good it is. They don't believe the good report that someone's given them or they are fearful and unwilling to face the enemies. In other words, they're unwilling to crucify the flesh and become dissociated from the world. And these people are in the churches now. They are in the number that was delivered from the bondage in Egypt. 
there in the number that survived the journey from Egypt and crossed over the Red Sea on dry, dry ground. They're in the number that went through the wilderness to Mount Sinai and then from Sinai to the border of the promised land. But when they find out there's work to be done and a cross to bear, they would rather return to bondage. They would rather make bricks without straw. They would rather be other men's slaves. They would rather see their children slaughtered than have to do what's required to obtain the promised land. See, that's now they wouldn't say it that way, but in reality, that's the choice that's made. That's right. <clears throat> Some people spy out the land and come to the conclusion that it's worth any cost to obtain it. And other people come to the conclusion that no matter what the cost is, it's not worth it. <clears throat> One sees the good land and the other sees only giants and walled cities. One believes an evil report, the other believes the true report. Yeah. One knows that it is doable and attainable through Jesus Christ, while the other recoils at the thought that it might involve personal cost. Another way to look at this is that whatever a person wants to believe, there will be a messenger provided to give them what they want to hear. <clears throat> if a person esteems the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures in Egypt and has respect unto the recompense of the reward, then they'll hear a message like this, the land which we pass through to search, it is an exceeding good land, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. But if a person has a real bad memory and longs to go back for the fish and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlics of Egypt, then they will hear this message. The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. The land through which we have gone to search, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature, and we saw the giants there, the sons of Anak. The apostolic way of saying this is, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they might believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. <clears throat> so there is a report to satisfy every desire. <clears throat> but there is only one true report, concerning the people of God in the promised land. And that is, the land which we pass through to search, it is an exceeding good land. And if the Lord delight in us, he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. I want to talk about the land first. <clears throat> and this, this actually, as I thought about this, it became more complicated. It, it can be a complicated subject because we're dealing on several different levels here. <clears throat> There's a sense in which we have already entered into the land and we're driving out the enemy. We're in the process of taking it over. <clears throat> Those enemies, namely, primarily being our own carnal natures, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and in this land that we presently pilgrim in, we're, we're planting and we're harvesting, we're reaping good things in Christ. We're spreading out in the land, we're discovering new territories, uh, finding more things that the Lord has prepared for us in this land. We're enjoying the bounty that we find everywhere in it. The scriptures say we've received the earnest of the inheritance in Ephesians 1.4. And yet at the same time, there's another sense in which we have not entered into the promised land yet. Now, this is exemplified in Abraham. He, by faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. Always, it was all, always had a temporary house, Abraham did. Never did build a house. He dwelt in tents, though he dwelled in the promised land. <clears throat> for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And we're told in the Hebrew 
epistle to the Hebrews, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. So both of these are valid. There's a sense in which we're in the promised land, and there's a sense which the the promised land is the glory of heaven yet to be revealed for us. <clears throat> From one point of view, the land still has enemies that need to be driven out by the grace of God. And from another <clears throat> and equally truthful view, the promised land, the rest that remaineth, is completely void of enmity and trouble. There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh the lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. But in either case, and from either point of view, the words of Joshua and Caleb here are still true. Whether we're talking about the, the land that we presently possess, or the land that we will yet possess, these words are still true. If the Lord delights in us, he'll bring us to it, and give it to us, and it is a land that floweth with milk and honey. <clears throat> I also want to uh, spend a few moments on this truth that it's his land. <clears throat> it was promised to Abraham, but this is repeatedly found in the scriptures that it's God's land. It's his land. Mm -hmm. And some people might think that that's silly, that God has an area on, the, on planet Earth. God has chosen the, some dirt in a location. He says, that's my land. Yes, he has. It's very clear in the scriptures. We'll see here. <clears throat> now there's a purpose that God is, is working out in the choosing of this land. It's a place that he has provided for his people to live. It was prepared for them, promised to them, although none of his people had their origins there. All of God's people had to be delivered from bondage and brought to the promised land. And in the end, all of God's people are going to dwell in his land together. So the land is provided for a, as a place to dwell. <clears throat> now, a dwelling isn't a place just so you can say, I own some property. If you think about it, really a dwelling is is how you gain and maintain stability in this life, is you have a place that's home, a place where you stay. <clears throat> Think of this, if you were homeless, how would people find you? How would someone contact you? How, where would you raise a family if you had no home, no dwelling place? Where would you work? Where would you sleep? Where would you store, prepare, and eat your food if you had no home? How could you have a job or a bank account if you had no dwelling place? So the land provides a place for us to reside. As we say, we make a home. It's a base of operations. The land is also provided to be worked. We plant on the land and harvest from the land and eat the fruits of it. Think of all the sustenance that's provided in the land. Now, there's, there's a lot in the sea, but that's, that's not the dwelling place for man. There's much more on the land. <clears throat> Every crop of vegetables grains, fruit, even the meat that we eat is sustained by what the animals eat off the land. <clears throat> there has to be a proper place and environment for milk and honey to flow, and it, it flows in the land. See, the land is, as Brother Fred would say, it's very utilitarian uh -huh. for God's purpose. <clears throat> the land provides abundant resources. It's good for growing food for both men and beasts and producing materials for building homes and businesses, and products for making fabrics for clothing, and etc. But it's also a place where like people can be near one another. There's a, a, a centralized location. His land is like this. We can plow together. We can reap together. Share our harvest with each other. Grow and advance together. Build together. Fight against and defend ourselves against the enemies together. So the land is designed to sustain us doing all of this together in one general area. God intends that all of his, all of his people be in his land. <clears throat> God can sustain us in the wilderness, and he has. <clears throat> he can make manna fall from heaven. He can make water gush out of a rock. He can dry up seas and rivers for us to cross over on dry ground. Amen. He can drown our enemies in those seas. He sustains and provides in the journey, but the journey is to get us to the land. Amen. See, all those 
wilderness provisions are only temporary till you get to the land. That's the main point. Some people, I think, have have the idea that it's all just about the journey. Just experiencing the journey is what Christianity is all about. No, the journey is in order to get to the land. <clears throat> so you don't want to miss that. Israel had no milk and honey in the wilderness. <clears throat> they had to get into Canaan to have that. <clears throat> and how we fare on the journey in the wilderness will be an indication of whether or not we will enter into the land of promise. God has indicated several times in the scriptures that he has reserved a particular land for himself and for his people. Yes, the whole world is his and all that is therein. God owns all of it. He created all of it. All of it's going to be reconciled to him. These are all true things spoken in the scriptures. And yet, there is a special location, a smaller sanctified area that God has reserved to be called his land, or also my land. Hosea, Hosea 9.3 calls it the Lord's land. Ezekiel 20.15 says that his land is the glory of all lands. We're talking about ground, earth. That's what he's talking about. Here's a text from Deuteronomy 32. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. So when we talk about land, we're not talking about, it's not a synonym for the people of God, it's land. Merciful to his land and to his people. Psalm 10, the Lord is king forever and ever, the heathen are perished out of his land. Jeremiah 2, 7, and I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. And again in Jeremiah 16, and first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double because they have defiled my land. They have filled mine inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. The prophet Joel said this, chapter 2, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. He's going to send all that to his people in his land. And one from Joel chapter 3 I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So you see the Lord, you, we're getting a picture how the Lord's going to use this land in these texts. And you know there's many more. This is just a very a small sampling. But the land, the land's important to God. It's his land. Consider the manner in which God works in his land. It's not in the same manner that he works in all lands. <clears throat> That's because God himself has chosen to dwell in this land. Right. This is a land he's put his name on. Jerusalem, the, the Lord's city where he's put his name, Jerusalem, is in his land. And the temple of God is in Jerusalem, which is in his land. And the Ark of the Covenant where God dwelt, was in the temple, in Jerusalem, in his land. <clears throat> so God has chosen this area to work in unique ways. <clears throat> God has chosen a land for himself in order to teach his people about himself. He chose a specific location so that men would understand the ramifications of being far from God and being near to God. <clears throat> God chose a specific location to teach men that they must make effort to get up and move to where he is. <clears throat> God chose a land so that he could demonstrate how men don't just get up and come in on their own, but they must be delivered and brought to his land. And he chose a land to show men how he is going to give them wonderful things and inheritance that he has prepared for them even before they knew of such a place. The Lord also deals with his people 
through the through way, the way he uses his land. <clears throat> he can cause it to abound and be fruitful, or he can cause his land to be dried up and not yield anything so that the people can't live on it. <clears throat> he can send enemies into his land to take over. And he can drive his own people out of his land. Or he can drive the enemies out of his land. He can put enemies in his land to teach us to war. And to prove us to see if we'll hearken to him. See, the land has all kinds of uses for God. <clears throat> in a sense, this is a, I admit, the way I express this is a little clumsy. I'm unsure about this. But in a sense, the land is like the kingdom of God itself talking about the kingdom that Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come unto you. Yeah. Not that the kingdom never existed before, but it's like now it's revealed. Now it's being made manifest to you. In a sense, this is the way the land is. God's using it for his own purposes. <clears throat> and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. <clears throat> and this is still true, true today. Mm -hmm. The land... The land has to be pressed into. The Lord has to bring you to it. There's some, there's some warfare to be done into the land, to get in and to stay in. <clears throat> there are enemies without, and the enemy within must be overcome in order to dwell in the land. Uh -huh. Just because the, the kingdom is the Lord's and the land of promise is his, we should not expect the absence of spiritual violence in this world. Just as Israel had to fight to obtain the land and to remain in the land, those who are delivered from Satan to serve God will find that when they are pressed into the kingdom of God, they are in a fight for their lives. Also, I can't help but think of the church along the, these same lines. There is a sense in which, comparing this with the land, there is a sense in which the church is without spot and blemish. <clears throat> And there's another sense in which the church has become defiled and an abomination to God, <clears throat> much as the land has been. It is the place of God working with his people in many ways. There are enemies in the churches. High things and false doctrines have to be cast down in the churches. Flesh has to be overcome in the churches. The land of promise, the land itself, is greatly affected by the men that tread upon it just like the land. <clears throat> God made everything and everything belongs to him and he works in some manner in all places, but he works in a peculiar manner in his land. <clears throat> and this is not a concept that came from man's imagination. <clears throat> God takes the matter of his land seriously, Amen. so to speak. <clears throat> this is uh, adequately demonstrated in one of Ezekiel's prophecies in chapter 36 where the Lord uh, <clears throat> commanded his eagle to prophesy to the land, not to people. This is God. See, this is very unique the way God works here. He, God has a word to his land, and he has a prophet deliver a word to his land. Also, thou son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel, and say, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy has said against you, Aha, even the ancient high places are our possession. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, because they have made you, that's the land, because they've made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side that ye might be a possession unto the residue of the heathen, and ye are taken up in the lips of talkers, and are an infamy of the people. Therefore, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, to the hills, to the rivers, to the valleys, to the desolate waste, and to the cities that are forsaken, which became a prey and derision to the residue of the heathen that are round about. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Idumea, which have appointed my land unto their possession, with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds, to cast it out for a prey. I won't read the rest here. This, it's the first 15 verses of Ezekiel 36, but the Lord has a good word that he delivers to this land because, see, men have come in and defiled it. And basically the message of the Lord here, I'm going to restore my land. 
I'm going to make it fruitful and I'm going to change who's living on it. I'm going to bring in my people. He says, it's, I will multiply upon you man and beast, he says to the land, and you'll increase in fruit. So this is, uh, we're getting a better picture of what the Lord's land is here. <clears throat> the Lord, the land <clears throat> has borne much because of men. <clears throat> Presently, it looks as though the land of promise is nothing more than a fable, even even in our present time. <clears throat> Israel has not possessed her land, and likewise the saints have not possessed their land. Intruders and corruption occupy both places, but the Lord has not forsaken his promise, Amen. nor his land, and he's going to change all of that. He's jealous for his land. Amen. So when we talk about the land, these are some of the valid things that might run through our minds. <clears throat> The land promised to Abraham is a matter of great importance to God, and it always will be, even in the world to come. God has determined for it to be so, for his own purposes. Zechariah 2.12, it's called the holy land. That's not a phrase that men made up. That's scriptural. It's the holy land. <clears throat> and this is, this is the land that's the subject of our text. <clears throat> It's the land that every Hebrew born in Egypt knew about and heard about. For 430 years, the promise of the land was kept alive in the hearts of the people while they were slaves in Egypt. Even Joseph even giving commandment concerning his bones, saying, God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And jo Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. This land was Abraham's inheritance and the inheritance of the entire nation of Israel. It is an everlasting possession. It's the land that Isaac sowed in and reaped an hundredfold in one year, and the land in which he waxed great and went forward and grew very great. That's Genesis 26, 12, and 13. It's often repeated that God will give this land to Abraham and his descendants for an everlasting possession. <clears throat> In our text, the people have recently just been delivered from Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, fought and discomfited the Amalekites. They received the law on Mount Sinai, and now they come to the border of the promised land. <clears throat> I want to look at our text. I'm going to kind of go through it backwards. I want to start with the end of the verse, a land that floweth with milk and honey. Now, Joshua and Caleb did not say there's some milk and honey in the land. <clears throat> we spied it out and we saw some milk and honey while we were there. No, it's a land that flows with milk and honey. The, the word means it's like it overflows. There's an abundance, and it's everywhere, like a, like a mighty river. It, it goes all throughout the land. It's flowing with milk and honey. <clears throat> it gushes out. Now, there's no record of any other land like this. God had specially prepared this land ahead of time for them to inhabit it. The, the scriptures make the note that when they went to spy out the land, it was the time of first ripe grapes, even the timing of it. See, God prepared it all ahead of time. God did for Israel in Canaan what he did for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. All prepared ahead of time, loaded with resources in abundance. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures." <clears throat> Now, this is the way God is. If you do not find an abundance, abundance, I say, of goodness and truth, abundant grace, faith and love in Jesus Christ, abundant mercy, abundant peace, abundance of glory, abundance of joy, then you're dwelling in the wrong land and you have the wrong God. <clears throat> His land flows everywhere with milk and honey. I like, even without me even going into any explanation, you already just get the idea of milk and honey. It's, it's good, it's sweet, it's gentle to the palate and to the stomach. Milk, you know, 
we feed babies milk. That, that matter of fact, that's the only thing little babies can eat is milk, and it's provided to, to help them to grow, to nourish them. That's what milk's for. It's very nourishing, causes rapid growth. <clears throat> Also, this is interesting, 20 times in the scriptures, from Exodus to Ezekiel, 20 times it says the land flows with milk and honey. So this is a point that's, that's emphasized over and over again. <clears throat> Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, he that hath no money. Come ye, buy and eat, yea, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. And Joel says, it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk. And all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. So the word, the word of God itself is likened unto milk by the apostle Peter. Yes, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. In other words, this is... This is how you're going to stay alive. Mm -hmm. You should develop an appetite for this. Yeah. This is, and it's sincere milk. It's, this is good for you. It's, it'll, it'll protect you. It'll give you health. It'll nourish you up, and you'll grow up if you feed yourself on the milk. <clears throat> this word sincere helps us understand the importance of it also. That is, it's pure. It's undefiled, not mixed with anything else. Milk is designed for pure nourishment, which lends itself to health and strength and growth. <clears throat> it's harmless, yet it contains everything you need for sustenance. And the land flows with milk. It flows freely with nourishment and health. There are no starving people in his land. There is no one who is not growing stronger and being built up in his land, because it flows with milk and honey. The scriptures tell us that manna <clears throat> tasted like wafers made with honey. And Jonathan, you recall, when he dipped his rod in the honey, his eyes were enlightened. Yeah. Honey, like milk, is a very pleasant thing to eat. See, the Lord, the Lord makes our nourishment very pleasant, very mild, gentle. It's sweet. What more could you ask for than a land flowing with milk and honey? <clears throat> Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, mm -hmm. that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Butter, of course, comes from the cream of the milk. <clears throat> Jesus was fed and increased. The Son of God mm -hmm. himself, when he walked on this earth, he was fed and increased from butter and honey. <clears throat> things that are pure and gentle and harmless and undefiled, his diet was the truth, we could say. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, when something toxic or something poison was set in front of him, he immediately, that's, that's not my food. God didn't send that. I was raised on milk and honey and butter and honey. I know that didn't come from God. See, he, know, he knows to refuse the evil. <clears throat> And that's how the Word of God is. As we eat it, the Spirit helps us to understand it. It's a joy to take it in. It's sweet and pleasant. <clears throat> An appetite for the things of God is cultivated and all else is refused. <clears throat> so eating in the promised land is a joy. Amen. The sustenance there is mild and pleasant and nourishing and harmless We're eating the milk and honey of the Lord's land. We don't have to worry about being deceived or poisoned by the fair. Here, that is here in this, this world, in this life, we do eat cautiously at times. <clears throat> Questioning or examining what's being served and who made it and what they put in it. <clears throat> Investigating to see where it came from. The nourishing things that flow throughout the promised land are not like that. <clears throat> they can be eaten in abundance and in safety. Another interesting thing to note about milk and honey is that neither one of them come from the earth. <clears throat> both of them, milk and the honey, both are, are processed. It's like a living process. Before it reaches your mouth, it's, it's processed through the cow and it's processed through the bee. It doesn't touch the earth. It's, it's something that's been purified and refined, specially adapted for your nourishment. I thought that was interesting. <clears throat> 
the Lord's fair and the promised land is refined. <clears throat> but now in this, in this world we see through a glass darkly. <clears throat> For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Not that we're groping in the dark, that's not what I'm saying, but we don't see yet everything clearly in this world. <clears throat> Just for a few examples, we're, we're going through the book of Genesis now, Brother Gibbons leading us. There's a lot of details left out in the creation. We got a lot of questions about that. There's a lot of details left out in the account of the flood. Just how did God choose his elect? You got any questions about that? <clears throat> What was involved when Christ went to preach to the spirits in prison? Got any questions about that? Anyone understand completely what the scriptures are saying there? See, there's, we, we see through a glass darkly here. See, but then, <clears throat> then face to face, we'll be consuming the pure, refined milk and honey of the glory land. Yes. We won't have to contend with distractions yes. and Babylonian influences and defilement of our understanding or the frailty of the mortal mind. Yeah. Then it will be face to face and we shall know as we are known. We'll take in the pure, undiluted milk and honey of the land and the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened. <clears throat> How he says... He will bring us into this land and give it us. <clears throat> the land is God's land, and he promised it to Abraham and his seed forever. <clears throat> he formed a people for himself. He prepared a land for the people, and only he can bring us into this land. <clears throat> it says, he will bring us, not we will go to. He will bring us. How did you get out of Egypt? How did you cross over the Red Sea? How were you led through the wilderness? How did you know where to go? How did you know when to pack up and move and when to unpack and make camp? <clears throat> Even to Abraham, God said, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And to Israel, he said, remember thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. <clears throat> and the gospel declares that God brought us out of bondage. He called us when we had no thought of being delivered. He pommeled the enemy and brought us out with a mighty hand. He dried up the sea for us. He led us through the wilderness and fed us manna and gave us water from the rock. Jesus delivered us and brought us to God. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, Amen. being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. <clears throat> Every step that we make toward God, we are being brought. There, this, is not, uh, this is not something we can do on our own. This is not the works that, that man can do, is to bring ourselves to God. We did not ascend up and bring Christ down. Right. We did not descend into the grave and bring him back up. The entire operation is the doing of God. No man will enter his land unless he brings them to it. Amen. And why will God bring us into this good land? <clears throat> to give it to us. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and the dominions shall serve and obey him. <clears throat> This is what God wants to do, not what he is obligated to do. <clears throat> Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure Amen. to give you the kingdom. <clears throat> Why is it when we have been faithful over little, he will make us ruler over much? God is revealing here in the gospel who he is. This is part of our being his people and him being our God. <clears throat> that he might make known the riches of his glory and the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Not only will he bring us into this land, but we will not be there as observers or as slaves to care for the land, but the land has been prepared to be given to us, the people of God. Our dwelling place is his dwelling place. 
Our life, our sustenance, our joy is owing to what he has prepared and given unto us. We get our God as our exceeding great reward. We shall dwell with him and he shall dwell with us. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away." Now, there is only one way that the Lord will bring us into this land and give it to us. <clears throat> that is, if the Lord delight in us. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, that's a sobering consideration. What can you do to make God delight in you? <clears throat> it's ironic that Joshua and Caleb said this to a people that the Lord did not delight in. <clears throat> I get the, the picture. It's like they're pleading with the people, change your mind. <laughs> Don't say this. Don't do this. If the Lord delights in us, he'll bring us in. Believe what he said. I get the impression that's, that's the gist of what they were saying to the people. But God swore in his wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now the next generation entered into Canaan. But even then the Lord declared that he chose Israel because the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. And he chose their seed after them, even you, above all people, as it is this day. Why did God delight in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Why did he apparently delight in Joshua and Caleb? God brought many people into the promised land because of their fleshly association with Abraham. But God is not bringing any of us into heaven based on that. God and Christ and the Holy Spirit must take delight in you personally if he's going to bring you into the promised land and give it to you. God has made all the preparations for everything else that he has purposed to do. He has also made the provisions for him to delight in you. That provision we know is in Jesus Christ. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine... This is spoken to Christ. And will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. It's Jesus that took our sins away and destroyed the devil. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind and opened the prison. It was Jesus that led captivity captive and ascended on high and gave gifts unto men. It's Jesus that intercedes for us and that is our great high priest. He gives life. He sends the Holy Spirit. He dwells in our hearts by faith. We are buried with him into death and raised with him to walk a newness of life. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus revealed the Father to us and will bring us to the Father. Jesus is the head of the church from whom every joint and band is nourished. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him. He is the power of God and the wisdom of God. He is unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We are the righteousness of God in him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now the only way that God will delight in us is if we delight in his Son. It seems almost trite to say that God will delight in us if we have faith, but we know... We understand here that that's not a trite thing to say. There's a lot involved in believing and having faith, as Joshua and Caleb could tell you. They they endured, after this, what we read here in our text, they endured 40 more years in the wilderness, and it was their faith, their belief in what God said, 
that brought them into the promised land, and the Lord gave it to them. <clears throat> Whatever God is doing is what men should take in as their greatest delight. Ancient Israel was frequently at odds with God. They rejected Moses. They rejected the report of Joshua and Caleb. They murmured against Moses and Aaron, and they murmured against God and tempted him ten times. Ten times. <clears throat> God did not delight in them, and they did not enter his land. <clears throat> Faith is what caused God to delight in the fathers. Faith caused Joshua and Caleb to give a good report and gave them entrance and possession in the promised land. Faith, a little later on, faith made David a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> everyone whom God has ever delighted in and everyone who is brought into the land of promise does so by faith. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Amen. Therefore, we can reason faith is what pleases him. Your faith will cause God to delight in you. And even, even then, he gave you the faith, didn't he? <clears throat> faith and believing not only covers a lot of territory, it covers all the territory. That is the answer to the question, how can God delight in us? Faithful people will be obedient people. Faithful people will be believing people. Faithful people will not doubt the word of the Lord or get angry with God. Faithful people will willingly forsake all that Jesus asks us to forsake. Amen. Faith counts for everything in the kingdom. <clears throat> That's because Jesus is the author and the finisher and the object of our faith. So then, brethren, if you would have God to delight in you, then you can follow our scriptural examples here of, of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Follow the examples <laughs> of Joshua and Caleb. <clears throat> And God will delight in you. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land. And verily thou shalt be fed. Yes. In the land that floweth with milk and honey. Oh, you'll be fed. Amen. Delight thyself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>